Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Sunday, October 11th, and this is the weekly market update. So before I get started, I wanted to remind everyone, uh, I started a new page, if you will. It's not really that um, big of an ordeal, but basically a lot of people have asked me where I get my ideas, what do I read, who do I follow, and what I created was a curation, investment letter curation site blog, if you will. And basically, uh, the articles that I read or the interviews or the videos that um, appeal to me, that I listen to folks that uh, I am following, I'll post those there. And you can take a look at that if you desire. And that's where I get a lot of my ideas from different folks that are way smarter than me. You know, as Charlie Munger says, it's good to cultivate uh, a following of or try to follow smart people and uh, take their ideas from them that uh, are good ideas because no one's smart enough to think everything up themselves. The other thing is that, you know, success leaves clues. When you're investing money, or trying to do things successfully in life, there's no reason to just try to round and rack your brain and think to yourself, you know, how do I do this or what should I do? You should go find someone that's successful at what you're endeavoring to do and copy them. There's no shame in that. So that's what I do. Um, not everybody that I follow I necessarily agree with all the time, but it's good to create that lattice work of knowledge in your mind and then you'll start understanding and seeing ideas will start forming on your own so anyway that'll be available I'll put a link to that in the show notes I did that last week if you're interested you can take a look so I wanted to get into the reality check this week and one of the things I wanted to highlight was an article by a Scottish economist that I followed for many years his name is Russell Napier Mr. Napier, for many, many years, maybe almost 20 years, has been in the deflation, disinflation camp. And I'd say over the last four, five, six months, I've seen articles come out and interviews with him where he has changed his view. And I thought it was important because I'm not trying to get into a confirmation bias here, but he was uh, interviewed in this particular article, which I'll put a link to, and articulated a lot of the same ideas that we've been talking about about how I see the future uh, going forward as far as monetary policy and the economy. Um, you know, I think that there's going to have to be an inflationary bias instigated by governments to deal with the crushing amount of debt that's out there. And they have done this before. We've seen examples all through history. The thing that I really want to point out and, and discuss before we get into some of the um, particulars of the article are it's not like a one-way trip right it's not like okay buy gold stocks today and six months and a year from now they'll be up and it's that simple you're going to have ebbs and flows you're going to uh, between deflation and inflation you're it's not like a one-way trip and there's going to be volatility along the way what we're trying to do is catch a major trend or theme that's going to last for some period of years, like probably a decade at least. And you say to yourself, okay, well, if I'm at, you know, the starting point of zero in 2020 and 2030, if I'm at 100 or 200 on that uh, particular thought index we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis inflation and, and what that means, then we can invest accordingly. I have no idea what will happen tomorrow, next week, three months, six months, or even a year from now. I do know that over the next decade, with the demographics in the West, with the debt levels, with the political shenanigans and divisiveness, I just don't see any other way to deal with the debt and the um, impending off-balance liabilities around Medicare uh, and, and Social Security. I mean, off-balance sheet, these, these liabilities that they have. So I see... A lot of inflation, uh, which has been the narrative, historical narrative, for governments all through history. There's nothing, like I said before, nothing new under the sun. But let's get into this article, which I'll put, obviously, links to everything uh, will be in the show notes. 
Um, like I said, Mr. Napier was a deflationist or de disinflationist um, for many years, but he switched his tune. So what's he say? Politicians have gained control of money supply and they will not give up this instrument anymore. Napier says, in his view, we are at the beginning of a new era of financial repression. Well, that's a word we've used before, too, in which politicians will make sure that inflation rates remain consistently above government bond yields for years. That's right. It's called negative interest rates. This is the only way to reduce the crushing levels of debt, argues Napier. Quote, politicians will realize that they have a very powerful tool in their hands. We saw a nice example of this two weeks ago. The Spanish government increased their 100 billion euro bank guarantee program to 150 billion euros, just like that. So there will be mission creep. There will be another one and another one and another one. So what he's talking about here is, is that the Spanish government didn't necessarily give 100 billion euros to the, to the banks. They just guaranteed the loans. So what the, what the, what the government can do as the sovereign is they can say, okay, bank, go loan money to X, Y, and Z, uh, green energy companies, to this company, to that company, bail out these people, bail out that people, and we'll guarantee it. They're not necessarily giving the money, but if it fails, they'll guarantee it. So that way you've taken a lot of the ways of pushing the inflation into the economy, which wasn't available during QE. That was the big argument, right? All this money was created by the Federal Reserve for these buying bonds, but it was sterilized. It never made it to the real economy. And so what he's talking about here, when you read the article, you'll see, or the interview, that he's talking about now that politicians understand they can do that. We have saw that in the U.S., okay? We've seen in the U.S. Paycheck Protection Program, these business loans, there's going to be more coming. They call it stimulus, whatever, but it's, it's, it's being directly injected directly into the veins of the economy. I like what he says here. These are politicians. We know what a mess most of the global economy is in today. Debt to GDP levels in most of the industrialized world are way too high, even before the effects of COVID. We know debt will have to go down. For a politician, inflation is the cheapest way out of this mess. Exactly. We've talked about this ad nauseum. They are not going to pay the debt back, and they're not going to cut back on the spending. That's how you get in a democracy. You won't get elected, and you'll be thrown out of office. You know, what, what, what should really happen? I should tell you what, what should really happen, which but would never happen. If I was made dictator for a day or for a year of the United States, can make any decision I want, this is exactly what I would do. I would immediately default on all U.S. Treasury obligations. I wouldn't pay them. Um, that would do two things. It would teach all those people that have enabled big government and wars and welfare states a big lesson that they shouldn't finance corrupt governments. I would also wipe the debt clean. Uh, I would cut, I would abolish all of the, um, most of the government agencies for the most part. I would slash regular, I'd take those books of regulation that they pile up 20 feet high when they make, want to make a photo op and just get rid of it all. Uh, I would turn most of the responsibility back to the states and lo local governments, which is would be more uh open to the people controlling them i mean you, you can't talk to a senator or, or a congressman i don't care what you say you're certainly not going to have any influence on the president but you can certainly have some influence on your school board your city council and things like that which really affect your life more than some policy in washington but the, 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 this is fantasy this isn't what's going to happen you know i would cut the defense budget I would do a lot. I mean, there wouldn't even probably be a defense budget if I was in charge. I would just slap $700 billion a year. Really? There's a lot of things that would change, but it's not going to happen. Okay? It's a snowball, snowball's chance in, in hell of that happening. So what will happen is spending will continue to go up regardless of who's in power, whether it's the Democrats or Republicans. I mean, it's an oligarchy. It's two sides of the coin. I mean, I like listening to this comedian, Jimmy Dore. And I don't agree with his politics. He's a socialist and he's very left wing, but he seems to be one of the most honest people I see talking on that side. And there's no, <clears throat> there's very little honesty. You know, he calls Joe Biden out for the, you know, basically establishment politician that he is. 
He's not for fracking. He's for fracking. Um, he's going to raise the defense. He's, you know, basically things aren't going to change. Is what you know. He's is is regardless if you put Trump or Biden in there. You know, it's just how it is. And um, so what is going what is going to happen is that the debt ke keeps increasing. And it will be a problem. And so what they will do, regardless, is they'll just you know practice financial repression, keep interest rates low, and pump up the nominal GDP so that over time the nominal rate of growth it won't be real growth now it'll be the nominal rate will be higher than the, and the debt burden will go down over time it's been done before now, this is an important paragraph here the cornerstones of the last period of financial repression after world war ii were capital controls and the forcing of domestic savings institutions to buy domestic government bonds that's why, you know, a lot of people that are in the financial markets or people that are listening to this weren't even born before, you know, 1980. And they don't remember when government bonds were, when the inflation rate was well above government bonds back in the late 70s, early 80s. And they, government bonds were, nobody wanted them. They were dubbed certificates of confiscation because if you were getting eight or nine or 10%, in interest from the government, you're like, wow, that's a lot of interest compared to what we get today. Yeah, but the inflation rate was like 12 or 13 percent. So you were losing purchasing power. That's why they were called certificates of confiscation. That's what we're talking about here. The cornerstone of the last period of financial repression after World War II were capital controls and the forcing of domestic savings institutions to buy government bonds. Do you? So this is the question he was being asked. Do you expect both of these measures to be introduced again? Yes. Domestic savings institutions like pension funds can easily be forced to buy domestic government bonds at low interest rates. And it's already happened around the world in other countries. You know, the insurance companies, Fidelity that runs your 401k, Vanguard, these are all government regulated institutions. They are there to do one thing, not make sure you make money. They are there to gather as many assets under management as they can, and then they cream off fees. That's how they make their money. Do you think it bothers them or they're going to fight back or they care if the government uh, passes or the Congress passes a law that says if the right people are in government and they pass a law that says, well, 30 percent of all 401ks must be invested in Treasury securities. And by the way, they're, we've already said what they're planning on doing, holding Treasury rates artificially low. They just confiscate your wealth over time via the, via the uh, inflation. That can't happen. It won't happen. Well, they're not supposed to be able to create special uh, purpose vehicles and buy stocks and ETFs in the open market, but they're doing it. No one's stopping them because it's crisis, right? We're in a crisis. Somebody needs to do something. Don't you understand, John? It's COVID. We've got to save the economy. We're going to do we, uh, everything's on the table. That's what people shriek. So don't be surprised when it happens. Nothing. Anything that you can, I can't even imagine probably all the little shenanigans are going to come up, but that's what's going to happen. And so this isn't like something's going to happen next week or something that's going to have a real effect or something that's necessarily actionable in the short term. But it, it's going to be, I think, an increasing amount of other people are starting to think that this is going to be the narrative over the next decade or so, not just in the United States, but in the developed world or whatever you want to call it, first world, developed world, you know, major economies, OECD countries, Europe, United States, Japan, that's what we're talking about. So I'll put a link to this, take a look at it at your leisure. So we have another company now that's bought Bitcoin. Remember I talked about this uh, other company, I can't remember, MicroStrategy, I think it was. And now we have Square, the payments company, held by Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, announced Thursday it has purchased 4,709 Bitcoins, a $50 million investment representing 1% of the firm's total assets. Square believes that cryptocurrency is an instrument of economic empowerment and provides a way for the world to participate in a global monetary system which aligns with the company's purpose. We believe that Bitcoin has the potential to be a more ubiquitous currency in the future, says Square CFO. 
for a company that is building products based on a more inclusive future, this investment is a step on that journey. Well, that's all corporate BS. I don't really know what they're, why they're doing this. I'm just pointing out that we're seeing more and more companies do it. And, you know, the last cryptocurrency bubble, if you will, was retail driven. It was driven by retail participants, regular small investors. Remember, people using their credit cards to buy cryptocurrencies. The next cryptocurrency bubble, if you will, will be uh, institutional. You'll see institutional money come in, and it's going to blow the doors off what happened last time, in my view. So, yes. It's beyond the scope of my newsletter or these videos to tell you and talk to you about cryptocurrency. I just don't have the expertise. But what I will tell you is that we are going to have another bubble in it. And I will tell you there's a lot of things happening in various uh, crypto uh, currencies, crypto assets, uh, all these things. You know, So I try to follow as best I can. I rely on other sources of information from other people that are smarter than me. But I think you do need to educate yourself and become aware of it because uh, there's a tremendous opportunity there. And I think that, you know, we're going there regardless. For example, just think of all the friction in the, in the uh, financial system. You want to sell or buy your house. You're paying these commissions, stock commissions. Well, pretty much going away now, but banking fees to transfer money. All these things are what I call friction. You know, if you and I want to c conduct a, a, a financial transaction, say you want to sell me a building or just I want to transfer money to you if you happen to be in New Zealand, I'm having to pay all these fees and jump through all these hoops. Why? And it's the financial institutions that are the gatekeepers that are creaming off fees. And I think there's a desire, at least in Silicon Valley, a lot of these people are socially very, very left wing. But I think uh, in many cases they are very libertarian in their thinking around finances and stuff like that to democratize these things to cut out the middleman if you will and uh, i think we're seeing more and more of that so i think it's a trend that's in place i think the millennial generation and people even younger uh everything's done on their phones they're very very literate and they're not going to be impressed with giving somebody you know a, a, a three or six percent commission when they go to buy a house just because somebody showed up and unlocked the door and tell them what great schools are in the neighborhood you know it's it's stupid uh, it's the same thing if they, you know a lot of we have a lot of people coming from all over the world now living in the united states paying these tremendous fees to send money back to their parents so i would suggest that over time uh developers and people are going to develop ways to remove this friction as I call it, from these various financial transactions. So I think that is going to be a big deal and needs people to keep their eyes on. Barrick CEO warns of gold reserve crisis. Barrick Gold CEO Mark Bristow, which is, in my view, one of the best mining executives in the world. Uh, he was at the mining in Daba in Johannesburg this week. He said that the gold industry in Africa should consolidate further as he warned of a, quote, serious reserve crisis, unquote, looming for the sector. He went on to say the prospect of a serious reserve crisis is looming. Gold production across the industry has only increased by 1.6% every year for the past two decades. And I just threw a quote in here. I threw my own uh, sentence in here because this is what I've been talking about, not just in gold, but in all commodities. There has not been enough investment to uh, bring sufficient supply online for these, quote, what I've said before, extractive industries. When you're in an extractive industry, i.e. mining, oil and gas production, whatever, if you are taking a certain amount of material out of the ground or, or oil, what have you, if you don't replace it, at some point you go out of business and we haven't been replacing these things. So that's why another reason if you, you know, you're already, are setting yourself up for a commodity bull market just because of the lack of investment and supply. And then you add on top of it the subject we talked about at the beginning of this uh, video, which is the uh, impending and long-term inflationary bias that most governments are going to be pursuing. And I think that uh, that sets you up for a tremendous commodity bull market in the future. Now, I thought this was good. JP Morgan to shift away from fossil fuels in its uh, lending book. So JP Morgan Chase says it is shifting its financing portfolio 
away from fossil fuels after facing years of pressure from shareholders and environmental activists. The U.S. Bank on Tuesday called for its clients in the oil, oil and gas, electric power, and automotive sectors to reduce emissions by 2030 and vowed to cut its exposure to companies that do not align their operations with the Paris Climate Accord. Quote, today's announcement is significant said Alec Conan of the Stop the Money Pipeline Coalition. The world's largest lender to the fossil fuel industry has clearly signaled that the fossil fuel game is coming to an end. Okay, a couple things here. JP Morgan doesn't really care about emissions or anything like that. They care about profits. Let's get that straight, number one. The people that are running that company do not uh, care one bit, one way or another. Um, but they see the zeitgeist, they see the narrative, for what it is, and they are going to say and do what they need to do in order to maximize the benefit for JP Morgan. Now, they very well could be cutting back. We'll have to watch and see if it actually happens. We did see that, you know, we have this now, like I've talked about in several other videos, this narrative that's been created that people seem to think is a uh, reality that we're just going to magically move to these new uh, energy sources, uh, ways of doing moving things. I don't want to say energy sources because they're not. They're just, you know, storage, different ways of using energy, shall we say, that supposedly are going to lead to less CO2. I've already talked about it in depth last week about the mining that needs to happen for these materials, the level of amounts of materials the waste that comes from this and all these other things. I'll put a great article by Capitalist Exploits up. Again, these are the type of things you're going to see on that uh, that site I was talking about earlier where I collect these things. But anyways, where it talks about the greenwashing that I think is going on. Again, we're not going to hear, we're not going to argue and debate. You know, you know we have states in the U.S., we have countries in, in, in the world now mandating that internal combustion engines will be gone by certain dates. So, People are going to be moving in this direction, no matter what the effects are or what the costs are. Do I think they'll achieve their goals? Probably not. Do I think they're going to cause a lot of disruption? Yes, I do. Disruption, chaos, and um, government intervention in the economy to force uh, an outcome which then is not achieved is excellent for speculators. That is an excellent opportunity for speculators. Why? You know, I don't have time to get into this, but it's almost like Thomas Sowell uh, talks a lot about these things. He's an economist. And he talks about, you know, these government officials that just make these rules up. They don't have to endure the consequences if the thing doesn't work, right? Because they're not like a shareholder or a um, executive of some company. You know, if you're running a company and you go off and make poor decisions and the prospects of the company decline or the profits go down, you go away more than likely. But, or you, you'll be affected, your salary, your stock options, things of this nature. But if you're a politician just says, well, we're just gonna get rid of all internal combustion cars in California by 2030 or whatever Newsom said, I don't even remember. Um, there's no repercussions if it doesn't happen. There's no repercussions uh, if it blows the cost out, there's no repercussions or or, or or consequences to Governor Newsom when he's out of office and they try to do this and the electric grid can't handle it because he's just you know just doing he's doing what a politician does says and does things to get reelected and that's what he thinks the majority of the constituents want to hear so he says it. I mean that's supposed to be a really terrible life to be a politician sitting around not having any really values or philosophical anchor and just licking your finger and sticking it up into the wind and, and figuring out what everybody wants to hear then going on there and saying it. I mean, imagine being like somebody like Kamala Harris. Call Joe Biden a racist. She was that little girl on the bus and he was supposedly for busing. Said that, you know, we have to believe all women. She's part of the Me Too thing. And then evidently uh, Governor or Vice President Biden's been accused of, you know, sexually assaulting women. We've seen him many videos where he's accosting young children, uh, sniffing their hair, uh, grabbing them in different places. Uh, so, you know, it must be hard to just then get up and say, you know, well, I, I want to be your, uh, that's all, you know, that's all forgotten now. I mean, this is how these people are.
you know, I'm getting off track a little bit, but that, that's it. They don't have to face the consequences. So they don't care. But like I said, I don't care either. They want to be sociopathic. They want to be liars. That's their business. Uh, they're going to create chaos and disruption, and that's great for speculation and investing. So do I think this is going to happen? I don't know. Um, if somebody comes with some bogus ESG plan, they'll probably keep giving them money. I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, what I'm saying to you, though, is, is that we're seeing more and more of this. Um, we'll probably see government mandates if certain powers, uh, people come into power. We've already seen, I think, in some areas, like uh, you must have a certain representation of, of certain kinds of people on the board of directors of companies. That legislation has been moving forward, I think, in California also. And as California goes, so goes the rest of the country. So I think these things, will, these these policies will create opportunity for us. They definitely are inflationary because they will cut back on supply. You know, we've seen the energy transition in Germany. It hasn't yielded the CO2 net reductions that they wanted to see. I think they've basically leveled out, but they're burning more coal now. And their electricity rates are some of the highest in Europe. And that's what we're you know, going to be looking at here in the United States. And that provides a lot of opportunity. I mean, I'm a big bull on copper because we're going to go full speed into this thing and there's not enough copper. So, you know, it's like um, the CEO of uh, Ivanhoe Mines, uh, Robert Friedland, said that you're going to need a telescope to see how high copper prices are uh, in the future. So keep that in mind. I don't get too excited on these things, but I do want to you know, give you this news because you can see we're moving further and further and further down that road. And uh, it needs to be monitored because, you know, it's setting up for the thesis. It's helping to un uh, uh, underpin the thesis, which is we are going to, uh, in the West at least, or in the developed countries, move to this ESG, um, EV, clean energy deal regardless and it's 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 the way that they're going to introduce inflation it's the way that they're going to right wrongs you know we're going to create agencies that uh, oversee this there's going to be a tremendous amount of money put into this we're going to have to hire we're going to be able to do diversity and affirmative action hiring that way and right previous wrongs get people into positions where they get a high salary blah 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 you can just see how the whole thing lines out i mean psychot chuck deberry Chuck Tabari, who was the campaign manager or chief of staff for AOC, that's what he said the Green New Deal was for. It wasn't for lowering CO2 emissions, it was to reorder society. So I think it's going to be a mess and it's going to create a lot of opportunity for us. Last thing I wanted to get into, cognitive bias and thinking. I'm going to put a link to an article uh, when I was doing some research on Charlie Munger's uh, thinking process. This article came up and it, there's a PDF attached to it. it's like 25 pages and it gets into like 25 common cognitive biases. And I suggest you take some time to read it and digest it because, you know, let's just read some of these points here that were introductions to the article because I think it makes the point I'm trying to make when I talk about critical thinking, removing cognitive bias, improving your life and improving your investment returns, not getting wedded to certain ideas. So your natural brain's pretty dumb and easily tricked. To save energy and make faster decisions, it relies on cognitive heur heuristics to make fast judgments. In prehistoric days, when we had to avoid getting devoured by lions, these fat, fast heuristics worked pretty well. Now that life is more complex, the decisions you need to make are more complex, and your cognitive biases trick you into making bad decisions. By learning these biases, you'll guard yourself against people trying to exploit you. Even better, you'll guard your, against your worst enemy, your own brain. By being aware of your cognitive biases, you can take a step back, gather more information, and practice more objective decision making. Making better decisions will ultimately improve your life. And as we are, you know, I'm not into, this isn't a weight loss deal or, you know, uh, how to be better at your job. This is about investing and speculating. And we have a lot of biases. And the reason why I started researching this more, I've talked about it off and on through the life of this channel. It's important. People get wedded to certain ideas or their biases take over. Perfect example is I put a, a whole video up about 
um, it had nothing to do with, um, what do you call it? Oh, the Green New Deal or whatever. It was about if you're going to do it, this is what's going to be required. And this is the kind of mining that needs to take place and what that mining means. How much physical facts about how much overburden has to be removed to get to certain you know, if you wanted to build a Tesla battery, how much actual ore is required, how much rock and waste rock has to be removed just to get to that, and how intensive that is, and how much energy that takes. Those are physical facts. But people actually wrote to me and said, why are you putting this up here? This is written by somebody at a right-wing think tank. What the heck does that got to do with anything? Are the facts true or not? That's what's important, and that's what people do. You know, I've changed my tune on renewables and the Green New Deal. It's going to happen. There's renewable mandates. The European Union's moving there. Depending on what kind of government we get here in the next three weeks, it could either be going towards it slow or at hyperspeed. And it's going to, it's going to be a tremendous opportunity for us. Yes, people's power is going to, costs are going to go up. So what? That's their problem. That's what they wanted. Okay. Cognitive biases don't let people, well, I'm against this. I mean, I met a rancher in Oklahoma when I was building a wind farm. He said, I'm totally against this. He was a big-time Republican, big-time right-wing guy, running millions of dollars worth of feeder cattle. He goes, I hate this. I don't want anything to do with it, but I'm putting them up anyways because he goes, I won't be able to sit here over the next 20 years with all the neighbors having them and, and, and knowing that I'm just giving free money away. So he let our company put them on his ranch even though he hated it. So I kind of respect that kind of thinking. Reality is reality, whether you, you know, regardless of what you want it to be. And these biases kill people. I've told the story over and over, you know, during the Obama administration, for example, uh, you know, after 2008 and, and President Obama got, you know, elected after the great financial crisis, oh, the economy is going to collapse, blah, blah, blah. Well, the Federal Reserve flooded the system with money and the stock market was up like over 150% during his regime. Who cares about his policies? This is an investment we're talking about. Okay? This is speculating. The stock market went up regardless of what his policies were because the Federal Reserve was pumping money. But I know so many people that just sat, you know, sat on the side because they just didn't like the president. Same thing with President Trump. He talks about the stock market stuff, but the stock market hasn't been up as much during his time in power as it was during Obama's. It's these biases that people let get into their mind. It affects their performance. And that ultimately affects the quality of your life. And what I'm trying to tell you is if you waste decades allowing these biases, then you can't recover. That's what I'm trying to get through. So take a look at these biases. I'm not trying to change your mind. You can believe whatever you want. I don't really care what you do. I'm just telling you that this is an important, important part of being successful. Again, look at what successful people do they leave clues listen to what charlie munger says okay he th this paper lays out i mean i give an examples the book the art of contrary thinking to be a true contrarian what what does that require most people cannot do it it's just that simple it doesn't really matter what you know you think is going to happen you have to look at the facts for what they are and if there's an opportunity, there's an opportunity. Now, if you are morally against something, well, that's a different conversation. You know, the best performing industry uh, in the history of the stock market has been the tobacco industry. If you invest, reinvest in dividends, but some people have a moral aversion to invest in a uh, companies that, uh, you know, kill their product kills people or contributes to killing them. And, and I respect that. But don't tell me it's not a good investment. It's one of the best investments ever. A dollar invested in Altria or the Philip Morris company, its predecessor in 1920, one dollar, one dollar invested in 1920 became like eight million dollars in 2020. That's with dividends reinvested. I guarantee you nobody rode that. Now, a lot of people had their health affected by the products that were uh, created by that company. But that's a moral question. That's not necessarily uh, a factual question around uh, whether or not the stock was a good investment. And the returns on capital were high. Those are two different things, and that's what that's the point I'm trying to make. So I'll put a link to that. You can take a look at it at your leisure, uh, or you cannot. It's up to you. It's your business. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Um, appreciate the support. Uh, cracked 5,000 uh, subscribers. 
Uh, we keep uh, adding podcast um, platforms at our anchor station. We've got Google Play, I think Overcat, all of them. I mean, we've got a ton of them. They keep adding more. So whatever your listening pleasure is, if you want to listen to these on podcasts, I'll put a link to the um, anchor site, and it lists all the places where you can uh, – um, get this podcast, Spotify, whatever your listening pleasure is, because a lot of people like to just listen to this in their car, I guess, or, or on an airplane or whatever they're doing. So we, we have that available. So uh, appreciate you listening. Thanks for the support, and we'll talk to you next time.